Not only am I finally back at home, but it's Sunday night, so Ash vs. Evil Dead Season 3 is back with a brand new episode. Episode 6 is titled Tales from the Rift. I hope you didn't think things couldn't get even more bizarre with Ruby and her demon kid because at the very beginning of this new episode, the kid is in some sort of cocoon, presumably evolving into... Who knows what, but before we get to see what that is, it's finally time for a Ruby and Kelly showdown. The shotgun-powered opening of this battle is just absolutely packed with fantastic effects and stunt work, especially the shot to the head Ruby takes, and then the camera taking us through the whole left there. But of course, Ruby is immortal, so next, Kelly has to bust out the Kandarian dagger. She puts up a pretty good fight there. It's definitely fun watching Dana DiLorenzo and Lucy Lawless go at it, but Kelly is no match for Ruby, not even with a grenade in her hand. But it is great watching Ruby's body reassemble itself after the blast. It is Ash Gore at its best. The crushing moment of this whole sequence, though, is what comes next. During some more hand-to-hand -hand combat, Kelly winds up getting stabbed with the dagger and dying, I guess. It's a tough moment to watch because it's a character I've come to know and love over the course of two and a half seasons now, but the show really lets it sink in thanks to Ruby's last line there, the music cue, and also the devastating overhead shot of Kelly just lying there with the pool of blood spreading around her. And as expected, the next step here is Kaya using Kelly's body as a vessel. While all that's going on, Brandy and Ash are finally starting to hit it off, and Toasted Pop-Tarts help with that, but then there's a knock at the door. It's more Knights of Sumeria. When Ash shows them the missing pages of the Necronomicon, they think they can stop evil for good. So off they all go, and clearly it doesn't take much for Ash to just forget he has a kid, because he just leaves Brandy at home, and he doesn't even tell her where he's going. From there, we get a car ride of exposition, and Really, Ash vs. Evil Dead tends to ace heavy exposition for a number of reasons, but this moment in particular highlights how good Bruce Campbell is at spicing up heavy dialogue scenes with the quintessential Ash inappropriate behavior in one-liners. Down to the details in this one, though. The Knights explain that Ruby used Kaya to exile the other Dark Ones. If the Dark Ones get free, they'll start a war that'll destroy mankind. Their mission was to find the prophesized one. So yeah, the Knights can check that off the list, but they were told the prophesized one would have the book. But of course, Ash doesn't. Ruby does. On the bright side, though, the knights think there's a chance that what Gary, the knight Brock locked in the cellar, might have left behind could actually help them here. Something that could maybe take them to a place called the Deadlands, which is where the Dark Ones are imprisoned. We've also got Pablo, who is back at the trailer, sorting through a box that Brujo left him, so I guess we'll never find out where he ran off to when he ran out on Kelly after their kiss in the last episode. And, you know, I'm a little bummed about that one because it was a big moment for the characters, but... This show moves at a lightning fast pace, so that plot hole can only be on your mind for so long. While looking for Ash, Brandy finds Pablo in the trailer. Pablo has a vision that Ash is in trouble, and then he takes off, leaving Brandy home alone again. But at least this time, he actually reunites with Ash, and also with the Knights of Sumeria in the hardware store basement. The Knights explain that the scribbles on the wall are a translation of the lost pages, and Gary may have found a way to open the rift. But no, not like the rift that led to the events of Army of Darkness. This one is a mystic passage between the human sphere and the Deadlands. If Gary did indeed find a way to open this rift, Ash could enter the other realm and lead them in the eternal battle against evil. Turns out, Pablo can decipher this incantation. He opens the rift and the knights decide to send one of their own in first for a reconnaissance mission, but he winds up getting spit right back out. At that point, Pablo says he has a bad feeling and who knows what that bad feeling is really connected to, the knight that just came back from the Deadlands or Kelly's death, but 
One way or the other, the edit there has a very, very powerful effect. But then, of course, things go all sorts of wrong with that knight, Marcus. He grabs another knight, and the two of them transform into this two-headed creature that rips the head off another knight with his spine still attached to it at the end of yet another fight sequence to add to the show's growing list of A-plus set pieces, we've got just Ash, Pablo, and the leader of this group of knights left. Now it's up to Pablo to figure out how to keep this demonic poop shoot closed once and for all. Oh, and don't forget, Brandy's still at home, and by the time Ash gets back there, Kelly slash Kaya is there too, Pretending to be Kelly, she gives Ash the Kandarian dagger, and that's where things wrap up, and that's where I'm beginning this breakdown. First, for the big question. Kelly can't really be dead, right? Yes, she died when she was stabbed, but let's say they managed to get Kaya out of her body eventually. Kelly can be brought back to life, right? It's tough because I want the show to have real stakes, and that means that characters can't keep surviving every single situation, but I also don't want Kelly to really die either. Regardless of how that part pans out, the sequence that got us to that moment was pretty incredible. It's easy to forget how much Kelly's been through over the course of the show since the very start, so even though the odds were stacked against her, her history, her sass and determination were just front and center this episode, and it was a blast to watch, and if it comes down to it, it is a great send-off for that character. It also moves the plot of the show along really nicely. This is exactly what Ruby needed to get to Ash, and there's no doubt that Kaya posing as Kelly could lead to some great interactions between them and also between her and Pablo in future episodes as well. As for Pablo, like I said, I would have liked to have known where he ran off to last episode, maybe to get that box from Brujo somewhere, I don't know. But still, they bring him back into the fold in a pretty good way that lets him start to show off what he's really capable of now. And I also found it kind of funny that that last night was kind of hysterical after the basement battle. It was making me wonder, how much of this battle of good versus evil was just passed down from night to night, and how much have they actually been exposed to? I was also just a little disappointed to see Brandy sideline most of the episode, especially because I'm really enjoying the connection she's building with Ash right now, but there is always next weekend, and I wonder if we'll see what Ruby's demon kid turned into then as well. Oh, and one last thumbs up for that Power Rangers ref something like that is just bound to make me happy. And you know what else makes me really happy? Watching this show and talking about it with you guys. So be sure to hit that comment section below and share some of your thoughts on this episode right there. Now it's on to today's Patreon shout out, which is going to Patreon newcomers, Billy Pollahan, Lewis Smith, and Brian Pay. Thanks so much for helping me kick off the month of April so strong. I am so happy to have you guys part of the team and I'll have a whole bunch of exclusive content coming your way soon and thanks to everyone out there watching these reviews and recaps please like share tell someone you love about Ash vs Evil Dead and I'll be back next weekend to review episode 7.